So I'm going to start out um, by looking at these South American Indians. So these guys have a problem. They live in the forest, and most of the animals they want to eat to get a high protein intake live up in the trees, and they can't reach them. So to deal with this problem, they've developed these high power blowpipes, which they project little darts out of with poison on the end of them. And the poison, curare, which is on the end of the dart, disrupts electrical signaling between the nerve and the muscle in the animals that they're trying to kill. So, oops. So it blocks the signaling, the spread of the electrical signal from the nerve to the muscle cell. And what that's going to do is, first of all, make the animal lose its posture, possibly, and fall out of the tree. But even if that doesn't work, um, it will stop the animal breathing, because you need your muscles to breathe. And so after a few minutes, they'll die and fall out of the tree. And then, um, they, oh, sorry. then they fall to the ground. You can pick them up and eat them. And luckily, the poison which is put on the arrows doesn't get absorbed across the human gut, so you can eat the poisoned animal without dying yourself. So the electrical signaling is clearly very important to those animals being killed, because if you disrupt it, um, then they die. Now, I want to give you another example of this. This is a, a cone snail, and I'm going to call him Conan, because he's a barbarian. And Conan also uses a toxin which disrupts electrical signaling. And Conan is big friends with a fish called Nemo. Now, don't get too attached to Nemo. Nemo is a bit stupid and allows Conan to put his poison tip proboscis into him. And this disrupts the electrical signaling going on in Nemo's body. And unfortunately, it's goodbye Nemo, and it's breakfast for Conan. This is speeded up twofold. OK, so a bit of indigestion at the end there, not surprisingly. Um, so this electrical signaling matters. Um, so what I've shown you so far is that brains, especially babies' brains, use a disproportionate fraction of the energy generated in the body. They evolve to do that by virtue of the gut becoming more efficient. And most of that energy goes on electrical signaling, as Frankenstein showed us. And this signaling is used for perception and for controlling our movements, in fact, all of our thoughts. Now, I want to look in some detail now at how energy is generated within the brain in order to power this electrical signaling. Because we'll see at the end, when I start to deal with disease, that it's a failure of the energy supply which creates a lot of the diseases which um, afflict, especially our increasingly aging population. And this is Anakin Skywalker again, the guy you saw doing the pod racing, but he's now grown up into his adult morphology. Um, we're going to come back to him in just one second, and he's going to explain where brain energy comes from. But first of all, if you want to improve the energetics of your brain, if you want to make your brain more powerful, where better to look than on the internet? <laughs> so it turns out there's lots of stuff you can buy on the internet to give your brain vi vitality, to elevate it, um, to give it power, to fuel it, to give it energy or attention, or more subtly, to modulate it. If you look at the ingredients in these things, none of them are of any use whatsoever. But there is one substance you can go out and buy, probably in the foyer, which will give your brain energy. And it's Lucozate. They do sell that in Australia, don't they? OK. So here it says, brain energy in a bottle. And if you can read this at the bottom, it says, clear thinking in a bottle. And you can see it goes into the guy and lights up his brain. Now, can this possibly be true? Well, there was a court case about this in England, because people asserted this could not possibly be true. But the law, uh, the court ruled, the, the Advertising Standards Authority found that this was a valid claim. And the reason it's a valid claim is that the main ingredient in Lucozade is glucose syrup. And as we'll see in a minute, glucose is the main fuel of the brain. So the fact that Lucozade is stuffed full of glucose meant that they were allowed to claim it was clear thinking in a bottle believe it or not. Um, I should say that, of course, there's loads of glucose in your diet anyway, and you don't need to rush out and buy Lucozade. Now, where is brain energy derived from? How do we use this glucose in order to power the electrical signals which underlie all of our thoughts? I want to 
go to the myth of Anakin in the, in the Star Wars movies. Here he was when he was pod racing, then he became a Jedi warrior, but tragically he um, turned to the dark side and became Darth Vader. Um, now, his power is called the Force in the Star Wars movies, and very luckily, in the later prequels to the Star Wars movies, a biological explanation was provided of the Force, and I'm gonna show it to you now. So you need to pay attention to how the Force is generated. Well, that would be bad. Um, so what's this all about? So his power is attributed to this high concentration of midichlorians um, living symbiotically in his body and giving him energy. So what are midichlorians? Well, this is a midichlorian, and you're stuffed full of them. So in, in the Star Wars nomenclature, midichlorians are a kind of hybrid of mitochondria and chloroplasts. Mitochondria are the power plants of animal cells, and chloroplasts are the power plants of vegetation. So for mitochondria, it's believed that they're like bacteria, primitive bi bacteria, which were imported into our cells about two billion years ago, and they live symbiotically there in the host cell, and they're still here today. Um, and the deal which they struck with the host cell was that the host cell would give them nutrients, and in return, they would make energy. Okay, so this is where brain energy comes from. This is what powers your electrical signaling and your thoughts. So how does it work? Well, here's a, a rather schematic nerve cell shown in green, and here's the blood supply. All the energy to the nerve cells comes along in the blood in the form of glucose, like in the leucosate, and oxygen. Um, now, in primitive animals, before the midichlorians arrived, the glucose was processed by um, chemical reactions, and it was used to generate a small amount of energy. But with the import of the midichlorians into our cells, um, that allowed the products of those reactions to be um, combined with oxygen to generate lots of energy. So about 90% of the energy generated in our cells is made by these midichlorians. And this is the energy which is used to pump out the ions which underlie the electrical signaling in our brain, underlie our thoughts. And we can recognize that this oxygen-dependent um, mitochondrial pathway for energy production is very important because the brain has very little energy stores and you know that if you cut off the oxygen supply to the brain, if you try diving deep in the swimming pool for too long, then um, your brain doesn't survive unless you go back up to the surface. So it's the midichlorians that give you your brain power. So here's a, here's a mitochondrion. Now, how do you decide where to put the mitochondria in the nerve cells? You know that in your house, if you want to run a refrigerator in your kitchen, you need to um, run a power lead to the kitchen and then to the refrigerator. If you want to run a TV in, in the living room, you have to have a power supply there as well. And it's the same in cells. They use energy in different places. And I told you earlier that much of the signaling, signaling energy is used at these gaps between the synapses. The, um, sorry, the gaps between the nerve cells, the so-called synapses. So how do you decide where to put mitochondria in cells? You need a mechanism to target them to where the energy is being used. Now this is a mitochondrion walking around a cell. And they walk around on these microtubule rails pulled by a motor which really walks along like this. And the motor tugs on the mitochondrion by virtue of an adapter protein which glues the motor onto the mitochondrion. So here are some real midichlorians moving around a nerve cell. Uh, you can see each of these white dots is a mitochondria, and it's been labeled with a fluorescent dye. And you can see they run around quite quickly, although the movie is speeded up 30 times. So some of them move around a lot, others move a little bit, and some of them are just parked. The ones that are parked are in parts of the nerve cell where lots of energy is needed. So how do you arrange this to happen? Um, what targets them to the sites of energy need? Um, well, here's a nerve cell again with its input end and its output end. Here are the synapses I told you about earlier where glutamate is released and generates an iron influx into the nerve cells. This is where half your brain energy is used, so you want to park the mitochondria near these synapses. And as I've just shown you, the mitochondria run around all the time on these tracks, and the red motor at the bottom pulls the mitochondrion 
because it's glued to it by a green adapter protein. So how can you make this be parked at the synapse? Well, it turns out the activity of the synapse itself is what parks it there. Because one of the ions which comes in at synapses is calcium. And it turns out the calcium binds to this adapter protein and unbinds it from the motor. So the mitochondrion can drift over to the synapse and make lots of energy. So the mitochondrion gets parked at the synapse in order that it can provide energy there. And that frees up the motor to go and be used for something else. So brains use lots of energy. It's used on electrical signaling. And that energy is generated by mitochondria. But as I've shown you, the brain uses lots and lots of energy, just 10 times more weight for weight than other parts of the body. So you need to focus the energy supply you've got to the brain on the neurons which are most active. And that means you need to increase the local blood supply in parts of the brain where the neurons are very active. And it turns out we can use that in order to look inside the living brain and image our thoughts, if you like. I want to explain how we can do that um, and give you some examples of imaging inside the brain. So here's the blood supply to the brain. This is how the energy comes into your brain. Although it's electrical signaling, it's a plumbing system which brings the energy in, in the form of glucose and oxygen. And if you have a bit of the brain like this, this is a wiring diagram of the cerebellum, so-called, at the back of your brain, which controls movement. Um, th these nerve cells are being powered by glucose and oxygen coming in in the blood. And the oxygen comes in joined onto hemoglobin, a protein which you've probably heard of because if your hemoglobin goes low, you've got anemia. And the oxygen then comes off, leaving deoxygenated hemoglobin. Now, when the neurons are more active, they need more oxygen. So they send a signal over to the blood vessel saying, hey, dilate, bring in more oxygen and glucose, please. Um, and this signal is mediated by the neurotransmitter glutamate, releasing certain messengers, either from the nerve cells themselves or from auxiliary helper cells called glial cells. So then the blood flow increases and more oxygen comes in, and you can think more with that little bit of your brain. So here's a movie of blood vessels being controlled by active neurons. So you can see the walls of the blood vessel here, and there are red blood cells moving around inside. These are what are bringing in the oxygen. And the green flashes are increases of calcium concentration in these helper glial cells. And they're releasing, when the neurons are active, um, these flash more, and they, they release messengers onto the blood vessel. And so if the nerve cells want more energy, they dilate the vessel. And if they want less energy, they constrict the vessel. So it's by adjusting the diameter of the blood vessels in your brain. This is going on all the time as you're looking at the screen now. There are vessels changing their diameter like this to adjust the amount of energy supply to the different parts of your brain, depending on which nerve cells are active. And we can use this to make maps of the brain in which we image the parts of the brain which are active, shown as these yellow and red splodges. And the way we do this is to put someone's head into a big magnetic field in a scanner like this. And what this big magnetic field does is it allows us to study how the protons, the hydrogen atoms, the hydrogen nuclei in water molecules, H2O, absorb and emit radio energy. So here they are, the little hydrogen nuclei. They've all been lined up by this magnetic field. And then in this technique, you put in a radio signal at right angles to this other magnetic field. And that displaces the little nuclei a bit. And as they wobble back again, they give off a radio signal, which you can pick up. Um, but it turns out that the radio signal they, put up, they give out is affected by the amount of deoxygenated hemoglobin, which is nearby. Because that's got iron in it, and iron acts like a little magnet, which affects the field they're in. And so when the nerve cells are active, that brings in lot, lots more fresh blood, which lacks deoxygenated hemoglobin. And that alters the signal which comes out and lets you um, produce maps like this of your thoughts. So what thoughts are we looking at here? Well, these are the parts of the brain which are active when you're in love. Of course, there are two types of love. Not good love and bad love, but um, maternal love and romantic love. Now, 
Romantic love is typified here by this classic picture from the Hotel de Ville in Paris, showing French people doing what French people at least think they do best. And maternal love is symbolized by this Raphael picture from the Renaissance. And there's a couple of interesting things that come out of this. First of all, the parts of the brain which are active for maternal love, shown in yellow, and for romantic love, shown in red, are on the whole completely different. They do overlap in one little place and make orange, but mostly they're different. So that tells us that maternal love and romantic love, despite the same use of the word for it, are completely different things, um, conceived by different parts of the brain. And maybe that's because maternal love is much less selfish than romantic love. Secondly, if you just focus on romantic love and compare men and women when they're romantically in love, it turns out they use the same parts of their brain to be romantically in love. So although the man and the woman may be thinking very different things, at least they're using the same part of their brain to do it. Here's another example. If you see a scary face or something that makes you feel dread, then the part of your brain that lights up is called the amygdala. So in this way, by using the energy supply to the brain, you can image which parts of your brain are active. So I want to turn now to um, death and destruction and disease with the aid of Superman. We're going to come back to Superman shortly, but I want to start out um, by talking about stroke. Um, this, is a, this image on the left is a blood flow diagram of a human brain of someone who's unfortunately having a stroke in the scanner. And um, the red, red hot colors show where there's lots of blood flow, and the blue is where there's little blood flow, and here you can see there's a big area where there's no blood flow at all. And that's because a clot has come around from somewhere else in this guy's body and blocked a blood vessel, and there's now no glucose or oxygen going to this part of the brain. And um, if you go back and scan this guy a day later, you find that this is a structural scan now, but in that area there's a, a vast area of dead nerve cells, so that bit of the brain isn't going to work anymore. And stroke is obviously bad news, it affects one in 450 people a year, and as I just explained, it can be caused by block of a blood vessel, or in a smaller fraction of cases, about 15% of cases, blood vessels can burst if your blood pressure gets too high or the vessel gets too weak. So there are also other diseases caused by a loss of brain energy supply. For example, if you're riding your motorbike and you fly off and hit a lamppost and you um, damage your spinal cord, one of the main causes of damage is that you crush all the blood vessels in your spinal cord and lose the blood supply. And um, for children who unfortunately develop cerebral palsy, one cause of that is that when they're in the mum's um, womb beforehand, if the placenta isn't providing an adequate supply of energy to the developing baby's brain, then they can also have a problem. Now this is the statistics for stroke incidents in Melbourne, taken from the kind of work that Jeff Donham, who introduced me, um, does. And what it shows on the left is the number of people who have a stroke out of every 100,000 people in Melbourne, how many people have a stroke each year. So if you're young, things are looking good. But when you get up to be about 80, then you can see about 1,500 people each year out of 100,000 will have a stroke. So over this 10-year period, 75 to 85, that means that um, about 15,000, about one in six people are going to have a stroke. And it's about one in three when you get to be older than 85. And the lifetime incidence of stroke in Melbourne is about 20% for women and 16% for men. And it's less for men because they tend to do crazy things and die of other things earlier. So it's because they don't reach so well this um, old age part of the curve where they're more likely to have a stroke. So stroke, I've told you what it's caused by. Let's see what it does. Well, typically a stroke leads to the loss of about 1.2 billion nerve cells about 8,000 billion synapses and 4,500 miles of nerve cell axon in your brain. Each of your brains has actually got about 100,000 miles of axon in it, so there's a lot of cabling in there. Um, it's the third leading cause of death, and it leads to paralysis and failure to speak, of course. So how does it happen? Well, it's all to do with electrical signaling. So if you remember, nerve cells um, 
send out impulses which have to jump the gap between the synapse here um, by releasing a transmitter called glutamate. But after you've puffed out this signaling molecule, you need to terminate its action again. Otherwise, you'd go on sending the same signal to the next nerve cell. So you have to stop signaling after you've sent it out. And it turns out that's done by helper cells called glial cells, which have got a little vacuum cleaner in them, a hoover, which is constantly hoovering up the glutamate, which is being released by the nerve cells. And although it happens rather slowly in this animation, in your head, this little glutamate hoover removes all the glutamate in about a thousandth of a second after it's been released by the nerve cell. But just like the vacuum cleaner in your house, this, this vacuum cleaner needs energy all the time. Otherwise, if you turn off the energy supply, it slows down and eventually stops. And worse than that, it actually runs backwards um, and pumps out all the glutamate that it's previously accumulated. OK, so this glutamate accumulates now between the nerve cells and it's going to excite this cell here, even though there's no information coming down the first nerve cell. And what's more, it's going to be exciting it, not just for one millisecond like it was doing before, it's going to be doing it for a period of tens of minutes. So if we focus in on what's happening to that nerve cell, there's loads of glutamate around, even though there shouldn't be because there's no signals coming. It opens these receptors and lets sodium and calcium into the cell, just like it would do normally. But the excessive amount of calcium which comes in kills the nerve cells. So this is why when you have a stroke, you become mentally or physically impaired. So maintaining the power to the glutamate hoover is crucial to stopping nerve cells being killed in the, in the gray matter of the brain, the bit where the nerve cell bodies are. OK, say you have a stroke. Why can't we do a brain transplant to fix it? After all, we can transplant everything else. If you want to do a heart transplant, you can take a heart out of someone in New York and fly it across the Atlantic in a bucket of salty water, cold salty water, and plug it into someone in Europe, and it'll work just fine most of the time. But if you try to do the same thing for brains, um, it doesn't work. Now, there are several reasons for this. The first is an ethical issue, and that is that there might be a confusion of who you really are after you've transplanted the brains, as shown in the famous duck to professor transplant. Um, but the second reason why this doesn't work is that as soon as you take the brain out of the donor, you've lost its energy supply, lots of glutamate is being released, and the nerve cells will be dead even before you've got the brain to the airport in the taxi. I want to turn now to a different kind of disease um, illustrated by Superman. Superman, of course, was a great guy um, to deal with emergencies. And in this clip I'm going to show you, he um, solves a load of problems by reversing time. But sadly, for the actor who plays Superman, things didn't work out so well because he fell off his horse, broke his neck, and was in a wheelchair for the rest of his life. So broken neck is not a new problem. This is the oldest known description of a central nervous system disorder, and it's from the Egyptian literature of 4,500 years ago. And it basically says, if you come across someone who's broken their neck and they can't move their arms or legs, it's bad news. You can't treat them. And sadly, that remains the case today. And it turns out that damage in spinal cord injury often reflects damage to a substance called myelin, which I'll explain what it is in a minute. It's a, it's a layer of fatty stuff around nerve cell axons. And this is also damaged when disability occurs in multiple sclerosis, where you have repeated cycles of damage to the myelin. And in cerebral palsy, where, which I told you about earlier, if you don't have a good energy supply to the developing fetus, then the baby's brain um, doesn't develop properly, and it doesn't develop this myelin stuff. So what is myelin? Well, here's a cross-section of the brain. I've told you about the gray matter of the brain, where the nerve cell bodies are. That's these grayer bits in this image. But half the human brain is white matter. And what the white matter does is it makes up the information superhighways of the brain, whereby information is sent rapidly from one place to another. You've got memories stored on both sides of your head. And if you want to think quickly, when the tiger is about to pounce on you and eat you, you need to think quickly. It's no good if the tiger storage bit is over here and the runaway bit is over here. You need to associate them quickly. 
if you send information between the two halves of your brain um, using ordinary nerve fibers, it takes about a third of a second to get from here to here. That's quite a long processing time. Whereas if you coat the axons, so-called, of the nerve cells with this myelin stuff, and this is done by cells called oligodendrocytes, that sounds complicated, but it just means a, um, a cell with a few branches, then that speeds the impulse, so it only takes five milliseconds, one two hundredth of a second to get it from one side of your head to the other, and that dramatically increases our cognitive powers. So here's myelin being made. One of these oligodendrocytes is putting out this fatty sheath, which it wraps around the nerve cell, and this movie isn't working. Great. Um, and um, I'll just talk through what the other movie was supposed to show. That lets the impulse go incredibly quickly through the nerve cell process. And the way it does that is the myelin acts to decrease the amount of charge that you need to change the voltage of the nerve cell. So you don't need so much ions to come in to produce a signal, and therefore it goes quicker. But if you lose the myelin, as is shown here, then the impulse goes much slower and dies out altogether. And so you become mentally or physically impaired. And this occurs in um, diseases like multiple sclerosis, cerebral palsy, as I've mentioned, um, stroke, and also spinal cord injury. Um, and so what happens in the white matter if, like Superman, you rupture all the blood vessels in your brain, in your spinal cord, that leads to a loss of the energy supply to the, the white matter of the nervous system, and there are glutamate hoovers there as well, which run backwards and release glutamate. And the glutamate opens little holes in the myelin sheath, and that destroys the cells making the myelin. And that's why um, people with these disorders, stroke, MS, um, spinal cord injury, why they can't walk anymore. 